Hey everybody, this is Geneva of Geneva's Closet Talk Show. Please make sure you like and share this video and subscribe to Geneva's Closet if you haven't already done so right here on YouTube. And you can follow me on Facebook at what? At Geneva's Closet. And you can email me at Geneva's Closet 22 at gmail.com. Now, let's get into the news. If you have not seen part one to this video where I was discussing Steve Harvey's ancestry, then go to Geneva's Closet, find this thumbnail, and check it out. Nevertheless, now that we have discussed where some of Steve Harvey ways may come from, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this video. Every time we talk about this man's relationships, we always talk about the same ones. His first wife, Marcia Harvey, the one he had the twins by, and Broderick Jr. But I want to know why the hell it take him so damn long to pay her child support. And then his second wife, Mary Harvey, Harvey, the one he had Winston with, and remember, he threw her in jail. Why the hell he throw her in jail just for talking about their divorce? What was up with that? And then his last wife, Margie Harvey, their perfect, beautiful, wonderful marriage. Now, they don't have any kids together, but he sure in the hell adopted all of her kids. Now, what I want to know is, how long these two really been together, huh, Steve? But what I think I want to know even more than that is, why did you treat your ex boo thing of nine years that you dated from 1991 all the way to two? thousand miss terry smith the way that you treated her why did you have your lawyers strong arm this woman into not releasing her book men will lie when the truth will do the king his queen and the other woman in 2004 steve but that's how i will get into it but just for the sake of going back down memory lane let's get into his past relationships marcia lee whitman was born on january 21st 1958 in jefferson county kentucky now i read somewhere that Steve and Marcia met about 7980 at a mutual friend's party. They hit it off instantly, started dating for about a year or so, and on Valentine's Day in Ohio, February 14th, 1981, the two were married. At the time, Marcia was 23 and Steve was 24. And just two years into their marriage, on August 20th, 1982, Steve and Marcia Harvey welcomed their twin daughters, Brandy and Carly Harvey, into the world. And then eight years later, for some strange reason, while Marcia is about one or two months pregnant with her son, in August of 1990, she decides to separate from her husband, Steve. And then eight months later, on April 29th, 1991, Broderick Stephen Harvey Jr. is born. Then in 1993, with 11-year-old twin girls and a two-year-old son, Marcia doesn't even try to work things out with her husband. She don't even see the point. She files for divorce. And one year later, in 1994, their divorce is finalized. In the 2016 interview with People, Steve Harvey speaks on his relationship with his ex-wife Marcia and the lack of relationship with his twin girls. And he says, I had never even heard of a comedy club. I didn't even know that they existed. Harvey won the $50 first prize during his first shot at performing, and he quit his job the next day. That decision did not go over well with his wife and the mother of his two daughters, Marcia. I'm married. I have twins. I'm supposed to provide for them. Harvey continued to struggle and only made $3,000 as a comedian in his first year. He and Marcia went on to separate and eventually finalized their divorce in 1994. His relationship with his daughters fell apart, something that took a huge emotional toll on the comedian. It wasn't until they got older that Brandy and Carly were finally able to understand why their dad needed to pursue his dreams. Years later, they said to me, Dad, we didn't understand why you left us, but we know now you had to go. You didn't just belong to us, you belong to the world. Harvey admits that that was emotional for me. All right, man. Thank you for trying to spin this narrative. So basically, you want us to believe that it's because you wanted to pursue your dreams, you quit your job and said you was going to be a comedian that Marcia left you. So that was it. That's the only reason she left you because you wanted to be a comedian. And the reason why you didn't have a relationship with your twin girls or all three of your kids, period, is because you wanted to pursue your dreams. That's it. Your final answer. You ain't going no further. Just that. All right, then. I'm reading from a 20 
2017 article with Radar Online, and it says, Radar Online got the divorce documents that paint the story of how Steve and Marcia split. Marcia claims Steve left her while she was pregnant and failed to pay child support. A source tells the publication, this is the secret Steve hoped the world would never know. His behavior towards Marcia and his family was worse than despicable. In the explosive legal papers, Marcia also accused Steve, now worth over $140 million, of stiffing her and his children despite earning over $1 million a year from the sitcom Me and the Boys. She claimed defendant has given the plaintiff an amount far less than is necessary to provide the bare necessities for her family. In April 1994, Steve was ordered to pay Marcia $5,100 a month in support payments plus her legal fees. But 14 months later, Marcia submitted an affidavit to the court claiming she hadn't gotten one red cent. In June of 1995 documents, Marcia stated, as of this date, I have not received any payment whatsoever from defendant Wonder Love Inc. or from defendant Steve Harvey. Later that year, Marcia was awarded $36,000 in back child support payments and his monthly amount was raised to $6,630 a month. But the divorce papers also showed that Steve moved in with his second wife, Mary Shackelford, before he had officially divorced Marcia. After they split, Mary accused Steve of bigamy with claims that he was still married to her when he wed his third wife Margie. Mary Lee Vaughn was born on October 20th, 1960 in Texas, if I'm not mistaken. And I read somewhere that Mary was a makeup artist before she met Steve. But not only was she a makeup artist, she totally had her own life. Because based on my research, she met and married a guy by the name of Bruce Shackelford, born February 1958. He is currently 63 years old and the two had a son together. On October 25th, 1984, Stephen Christopher Shackelford was born and he is currently 36 years old. And then five years later, on January 1989, Mary meets Steve in the comedy club and based on what I read, they fell in love. But not only did they fall in love, they also moved in together because I heard that they had been shacking up at least five years before they even got married. Mind you, January in 1989, when they meet for the first time, this is only one and a half years after Steve and Marcia have separated. Nevertheless, on June 21st, 1996, Steve and Mary are married in Clark County, Nevada. Steve was 39 years old and Mary was 36. And then on July 18th, 1997, Steve and Mary welcomed their son, Winton Harvey, into the world. And Steve oldest children by his first wife, Marcia. His son, Broderick Jr., is six years old, and his twins, Brandy and Carly, are 15. But for some strange reason, Again, something happens in Steve and Mary's marriage between 97 and 2005 because Mary files for divorce and in 2005 their divorce is finalized. Now, people, this is when things take a dramatic turn in Mary's life. Now, I know you heard that after their divorce in 2005, Mary was sent to jail twice because of Steve. One time in 2011, and I think she probably spent a day in jail. And another time in 2013, she spent Christmas Eve, Christmas, and New Year's in jail. She didn't get out to 2014. We're going to get into it. So, listen to this. The reason behind Steve and Mary's nasty divorce was that Steve was unfaithful to his wife, Mary. Mary accused Steve of cheating with Marjorie. The accusations escalated as Steve began an affair with Marjorie and married her in 2007, barely two years after divorcing Mary. Mary went ahead to upload various videos on YouTube claiming that Steve abused her mentally and physically while they were married. This threatened Steve's reputation and public image 
damage and he took legal action against Mary. Now this is what I heard transpired between Steve and Mary, the reason why he threw her in jail the first time in 2011. Now I had heard that, remember Steve and Mary's divorce was finalized in 2005 and then Steve married Marjorie in 2007. Well, in 2008, why Mary is living in her own homes that she got from the divorce, next thing she knows Steve is over there trying to throw her up out of her house, out of her own homes, which ultimately made her feel a certain type of way. Next thing she know, she gets Winton back. Winton comes back home and Winton got some bruises on him. So of course she go to the police station, file abuse charges against Steve, which ultimately pissed Steve off. Next thing you know, Steve come back and he get Winton. Now we all know why he did that to make it seem like, what are you talking about, Mary? I would never abuse my son. Now while all this is going on, I think Mary is feeling a certain type of way because she's starting to notice now that there was some conspiracy and some crookedness going on with Steve, the lawyers, the judges, and Marjorie. So she started going out doing a little talk and trying to tell her story. The next thing you know, in 2011, she's being thrown in jail. Now when she asks, what am I being thrown in jail for? They tell her she being thrown in jail because she owed back child support, which was totally confusing to her because one, she didn't even have a child support case, and two, she didn't even owe any back child support. So that's how for Mary, she knew that it was some crookedness going on with Steve and his people. Anytime Steve Harvey talks about him and Mary, he is never going to tell the truth on what really transpired between these two. He is always going to make it seem like Mary is just some bitter, jealous ex-wife and she just won't get over it. But that's all right because we're going to read this report on this child abuse case between Steve Harvey and his son, Winston Harvey. And it says, on October 18th, 2008, at approximately 1.30 hours, Officer Carter was dispatched to Medical Center of Plano for an investigation. Upon arrival, Officer Carter met with reporting party Mary Harvey, who stated that on October 17th, 2008, at approximately 2030 hours, which is 8.30 p.m., she picked up her son, Winston Harvey, from the airport. Ms. Harvey stated that she and her son went to their residence, at which time Winton told her that approximately two weeks ago, he had received a whipping from his father, Broderick Harvey. Ms. Harvey told me that Winton has sustained bruises on his legs and buttocks from the whipping. I then met with Winton Harvey, who stated that approximately two weeks ago, while at home, his father, Broderick, had received a telephone call from his teacher, and his teacher stated that he had not turned in and lied about turning in some homework. Winton stated that his father then got upset and gave him a whipping for lying to the teacher. Winton stated that during the whipping, his father whipped him with a belt and also a paddle board. I asked Winton to describe the paddleboard and his mother stated it was similar to a board which is used by fraternities. Winton stated that after the whipping, for the next two days he had pain when he urinated. I then asked Winton to show me the bruises and I observed bruises to the right thigh of his leg and also bruising on his right buttocks. I also observed a cut on the right thigh of Winton's leg. I then met with Miss Harvey, again, who stated that after hearing the story of the whipping, she decided to take Winston to the medical center of Plano to have him evaluated. Miss Harvey then advised me that approximately two years ago, when Winston was nine years old, he received bruising from another whipping, which he received from his father, Broderick Harvey. I then summoned for a CSI unit to come and take photographs of the injury. CSI number 13, Richard Wilson, arrived on scene and took photographs of the injury. I then made contact with Child Protective Services and reported the incident. The report was taken by Lisa. I then issued Miss Harvey a copy of the incident number and cleared the scene. Now remember people, this is October 20th, 2008. Okay, now let's go over a few things. I just read to you this child abuse report that Mary made against Steve for some abuse that Steve did to his son, Winston Harvey. And remember, this is dated for October 2008. This is not even a year after Steve had married Marjorie, because if I'm not mistaken, they got married in December of 2007. Now, mind you, Mary is definitely upset because the marriage 
is supposed to be over, right? In 2007, finalized. But she's still getting kicked out of property. She's trying to figure out why is her name still on stuff. She's noticing that Marjorie has forced her name on documents. She's seeing Marjorie signed her name before 2007, Marjorie Harvey. And she is feeling some sort of type of way about these things. And she's going out and she's speaking up and she's trying to have her voice heard. And not only that, like I said, she made this child abuse report report against Steve, which Steve don't like that because he is a celebrity. Mary gonna make him look bad to the people with this report. So not even six months later, people in April of 2009, check this out. On April 7th, 2009, just six months after Mary made that child abuse report against Steve Harvey, she gets a letter sent to her attorney, which at the time I think was Paget from Steve Harvey and his attorney, Bobby Edmonds. Now, let me just explain something to you right quick about Bobby Edmonds, this attorney that is supposed to be a family attorney that Mary Harvey hired to be her attorney when she was, when she found out about this abuse that happened with Winton. And do you know that Bobby Edmonds, her attorney, end up turning against Mary and going on Steve Harvey's side? So that was not Steve Harvey's attorney. Bobby Edmonds was Mary's attorney that she hired when she found out about this abuse. And Bobby Edmonds turned and went on Steve Harvey's side. So this letter is a three-part letter dated for April 7th, 2009 from Steve Harvey and his attorney, Bobby Edmonds. And I'm going to try to read all of it to you. And this is what they wanted Mary Harvey to sign. Now you let me know if this sounds like a blackmail letter. I don't know. Or does it just sounds like, you know, Steve Harvey just wanted to make amends with his ex-wife, Mary Harvey. You let me know. And it says the first page, Dear Mr. Paget." Remember, Mary's attorney, per my letter to you dated April 6, 2009. So that means that there was a letter written, written to Mr. Pageant, Mary's attorney, the day before on April 6, because this is now April 7, 2009. In close, please find a copy of the apology letter we have prepared for you and Miss Mary Lee Harvey's review. Per my client's instructions, if the apology letter is executed by Miss Mary Lee Harvey, he is willing to remove the enforcement hearing from the April 22, 2009 docket. Again, please discuss the same with your client and let me know her response. If she signs the document, please return the executed original document to my office. I look forward to hearing from you on or before Friday, April 10th. 2009. Thank you in advance for your cooperation to this matter. Sincerely, Bobby Edmonds, attorney at law. And then it says, Dear Steve, I am writing this letter freely and voluntarily. It is time for me to realize that my attempts to hurt you and destroy the things you have tried to do and are trying to do to make your life and our son's life more meaningful were wrong. I was hurting emotionally and it took time for me to realize what I was doing to you also impacts our son. I realized that I have acted in a manner in the last few years to cause you to be on the defense to combat negative and false allegations over the internet and newspapers and other mediums to interfere with your character, life and current family. It was inconsiderate of me. I know that my actions the actions of my agents, employees, and others who have worked for me have negatively impacted you, your present family, and most importantly, our son, Winton. He should have been the center of my love, and yet the negative things I have said or caused to be said about you in lawsuits and otherwise have inadvertently harmed our son emotionally. I have to deal with that and answer to God for my behavior, but... I also ask for your forgiveness. I rescind the false allegations against you regarding domestic violence and child abuse when I knew in my heart that you never have done those awful things. I know that you love our son and would do anything legal to protect him. You are a loving father. When we were together in our marriage, 
You are the kind of husband who provided financially and tried to provide emotionally to the extent that you could for our family. You even tried to get me the assistance I needed to deal with some turbulent times. Since we are no longer a family unit, I understand that we will always have a bond because of our son, Winton. We always have the duty to act in the best interest of our son for the rest of our lives. Steve, I have prayed to God for forgiveness, and I, and I now ask for your forgiveness. I promise that I will not say or cause to be said, written or printed, any false, misleading, or disparaging things about you in the future. I will abide by Judge, Judge Dry's order in this regard and keep the court documents and information in the file sealed. From the public's view, I realize that you sought the sealing of this record as a measure to protect our son from a lot of unnecessary anxiety from his peers and others and to protect us as a unit from a media frenzy. I realize now how unpleasant media exposure can destroy children and impact our son's overall development in life. Third letter. I want to put an end to the court battle between us and move on with my life, knowing that the two of us will always be in communications because we have a son to be proud of and to make sure that he gets all the love he is entitled to, to from us his sisters and brothers, and blended family. I understand that we may not agree on all things, but I promise that we will discuss those matters and work them out in a fair and reasonable manner without threatening and negative exposure to the media. I want all of this to stop and for this letter to serve as closure to the back and forth court appearances, including the up and coming hearing on April 22nd, 2009. I want us to be parents and friends for life with the best interest of our son, Winton, being first. I know that even though we are not together, that you are a good man, a good father to our son and your other children. We can share this letter with your present and future sponsors slash employers if it will help to clear up some of the disparaging and false information which has been printed about you in our post-divorce litigation and in the public, I am ready to accept our lives as they are and to move forward. Again, I ask that you accept my sincere apology. Signed this date of April 2009, Mary Lee Harvey. The above named person appeared before me and sworn that the statements contained in this letter are true and are made freely and voluntarily on this day of April 2009. Ooh, wee! That sounds like a little bit of blackmail to me. All right, Steve, I'm in Bobby Edmonds and Judge Dry and all of our crooked people. So, Mary wrote that letter on her own free will, right? <laughs> That was supposed to be her own free will, and it was supposed to make it seem like she's just so sorry, and she's just talking and saying things, and she don't mean these things, and she's just trying to hurt you and hurt your family, but she should be more concerned about Winton and those abuse allegations, and you know that... I know that I would never that Steve would never hurt Winton. He would never do anything wrong. He's such a good man. And I care about your blended family and everybody else. And you can use this information and give it to the media and the press and the sponsors if you feel like that would do anything to help out your career. I was like, whoa. And then he wanted to make sure that, and then you sign this letter, them litigations that's gonna happen in 2009. That's not gonna happen. Which we see that this letter was written April in 2009. He had a court date coming up April of 2009. So well, Steve just wanted to make sure that, and I'm pretty sure that court date has something to do with them child abuse charges, and he wanted to make sure that that stuff didn't stick. But guess what? Mary did not sign that letter in 2009, and that mixed with other things is ultimately why she ended up in jail in 2011, even though Steve wanted the media to make it seem like, like I said earlier, that she is just a bitter and upset ex-wife who's mad that she's not with Steve anymore and she not getting into the money and she ain't getting all of this when there was so many other things going on in the background see that's the thing about these celebrities we think we know them but we have no idea
I'm about to read an article from the Jasmine brand where Mary speaks of her marriage with her and Steve and the issues that they had. And it says on his infidelity, he was always a cheater. I didn't always know. It got worse when he got more access to money. She also claims that he may not have always been the most protective lover. Ouch. She suggests that Steve had an affair with current wife Marjorie and explains his current wife should have left herself out of our marriage. Marjorie wanted my life and Steve one and Marjorie on Steve being a relationship expert uh, we need to rethink that whole situation and ask some serious questions accountability if you concentrate long enough on what a person says the answer is right there on their financial status before he became a celebrity Steve and I were absolutely broke in the worst kind of way pinto beans and jiffy cornbread he was making $25 a week on comedy she explains that initially Mary worked as the breadwinner on why she decided to divorce Steve, I no longer could deal with what he was doing. Several instances. Marjorie was one of many. She had actually filed divorce three times. They, Steve and Mary, decided to use a mutual attorney so that the public would be unaware of the divorce. The judge instructed the couple to divide the property. Steve never got back to her on the property division. Long story short, she received a total of $400,000. I said, Rupert. How and why does Steve have their son? Initially, she had custody of their son, Winton, until the end of 2008. Emotionally, she was unable to take care of their son. Winton missed his father, and she sent their son to live with Steve and Marjorie. She also says that Steve disowned their 26-year-old son, Stephen. Now, we all know, because I said it uh, earlier, that Steve is, is, is not really Steve's biological son, but he took care of him since he was four years old. Now, mind you, this article is written January 2011 from the Jasmine Brown, and it says on allegations from her former personal assistant, backstory, last week, Mary's former assistant, Jocelyn, spoke out and said that Mary was basically unstable, and it's the reason why Steve did not land a TV gig on Oprah's own network. Mary agrees that Jocelyn was right in the fact that she was emotional and erratic. She blames her own actions on the divorce that her and Steve were going through. She does dispute that she gave her son away to Steve. Sidebar, Mary confirms that her assistant was not fired, but was released by her. She also shares that Mary gifted her assistant with a valuable piece of property while she was her assistant. Yes, now I had heard that Mary gave this assistant Jocelyn a house just so this assistant Jocelyn can turn on her, just like Bobby Edmonds did. And just like how eventually um, Mary's attorney pageant did, Jocelyn turned on her and went to what? Steve Harvey's side. Anyway, the article goes on to say, Steve alleges that Mary Harvey is the reason that he didn't receive his own show on Oprah's own network. Steve suggests that Mary had a conversation with Oprah that resulted in Steve not getting his own show. Steve is suing Mary now for this. Mary disputes this allegation on Steve's hygiene. Charlemagne mentions that he worked with Steve on a radio show while in New York City and noticed that Steve never washed his hands. Mary replied, huh, there was a whole lot of things he never washed. You know what I mean? The interview ended with Mary being questioned about Steve's hair, wig, hairline. They flat out asked if he was rocking a wig. She sort of giggled and uh, sidestepped the question. Okay, now. Mary dealt with a lot dealing with Steve, which ultimately got her back in jail in 2013. And this is where Essie Berry, civil rights activist Essie Berry, comes in at. And if you don't know who Essie Berry is, she is the widow of Fred Rerun Berry from the hit 70s show, What's Happening? Well, yes, in 2013, Miss Essie Berry was working with some producers on a reality show called Widows and Wives or Widow Wives and Ex-Celebrity Wives. It was called something like that. And Essie was trying to think of all the people that she wanted to be, and it was going to be her and some of Fred Rerun Berry's ex-wives. And then she thought of Mary Harvey because she seen Mary Harvey being interviewed on TV. So eventually Essie gets in contact with Mary. Now remember Essie not even thinking about this whole Steve Harvey situation. She's not really 
really paying attention to the drama that's going on with Mary and Steve. She thinking about her reality show. So she talks to Mary on the phone and then tells her about the reality show. Mary tell her that she's interested in it, but she has a gag order on her. So Essie like, oh, okay, so what you got a gag order on you for? And she was like, you know, because I can't talk about the divorce. She was like, okay, so why can't you talk about it? And Mary was like, well, um, I don't know because I never seen my final divorce papers. Now, if you don't know, like I already said, Essie Berry is a spitfire cracker. She's very outspoken and she moves. And if she sees somebody is going through something and you tell her that you're going through something, she's going to see what she can do to try to help the situation out, i.e. her being a civil rights activist. So, Essie said, well then, what's your attorney name and woo woo woo? So, Mary gives her pageant's name. Now, at this time in 20. 13, I don't think that that was uh, Mary's attorney anymore. But anyway, Essie contacts Padgett and say, look, I'm a Mary civil rights activist. She ain't never seen her divorce papers. I better get all of this stuff. Whoop -de -whoop -whoop -whoop. Next thing you know, Essie gets the document. And then she started reading over the divorce papers and seeing all the forged signatures, conspiracy and collusion, her words, and said, oh, hell no. And that's what set her off. And then from there on, Essie said, well, then I got your back and her and Mary end up talking next thing you know Essie is the power of attorney for Mary and she's speaking for Mary she's going on YouTube she's making these videos she letting it be known that Mary got played and the stuff that she was supposed to get documents have been signed Margie was up in here signing the documents Steve done did this he done snatched his property from her he abused his son this is all the stuff he did and Steve said oh hell no nah. who is this loud mouth woman Mary you done went and said what to who the who and and next thing you know, Mary was thrown in jail in 2013. If I'm not mistaken, it says she was thrown in jail on December 19th, 2013, and didn't get out till January 17th, 2014. Steve had her sitting there for a whole month, one whole month. When Steve sent Mary to jail for that 30 days, Mary was stunned. She couldn't believe that her ex-husband and the father of her child would sit up there and throw her in jail like that just because she was speaking on him not doing what he was supposed to be doing and the shystiness with him, the attorneys, the judges, with Marjorie and everyone else in Steve's corner. And um, because of that, that put a pause on anything that was going on with Mary and Essie at the time. But um, I think Mary was just sick of it because she did come back out in 2017. But we're going to get into a whole lot more with Mary and Essie Berry a little bit later. But for right now, I want you to check this out. I, uh, just me being a mom, I respect the job because when God gives us children, he put them in our care custody and he expects us to do right by our children. That's what he expects us to do. I know that as a mother, if I was ever in a position to where uh, I had to be in charge of somebody else's child, I'd definitely make sure they have a great relationship with that child. But I just don't see how Marjorie in particular can call herself a mother to her own children and deliberately try to sabotage my relationship with my son. I don't really get that because personally, you know, even if it was a, a vengeance vendetta thing, it's like who did harm to who, you know? If you did harm to someone, if it had been me in her position, I think I would move heaven and earth to try to make it right by this woman and her son. Don't know? want to interrupt you, but are you a Marge friend or were y'all ever friends? You know what, that rumor was out there, but I, Marge and I were never friends. We were never, ever friends. I don't know how it got out there that I was confiding in her about my marriage. I never, never met the woman until after the fact. Wow. You know, voice over the phone once, and I didn't even know who the voice belonged to at that time, but I never knew her, never knew her. And even in all the years that uh, she's been stepmomming with my child, uh, we've never met face to face, you know, uh -huh. so to me, um, I don't believe in dysfunction. I was raised in dysfunction. I know what it is. I know the damage it can do. And I don't believe in that. And for the sake of my child, I have always from day one wanted to keep an open relationship so that Winton would not feel that he had to choose camps because that is so unfair and it is so unnecessary. 
And especially in this case, was it not necessary? And uh, I, I, to me, I'm always a communicator. To me, everything. Let's talk about it. Let's put it on the table. And it's not about whether you like something or you don't like something. Let's talk about it, you know? That's just me. That's, that's, that's one of my pet peeves. I love communicating. But it would disturb me, really, uh, when family or friends would come to me and say, hey, uh, I saw Winton on the show today. And that would really disturb me because I would see images of her embracing him and hugging him and calling him, oh, this is my baby. But how can you say that you love this young man and persecute his mother on right. either side? How could either of them do that? For Steve to constantly say, oh, I love Winton. And on one show, um, and I don't ever watch. I can't ever watch. When my family say they've seen something, I usually wait for it to go to YouTube, and that way I can watch it in my own discretion. So right. that if I'm in a bad mood, I can just click and go back. But I never watched the show. But in one particular scene, he was talking to Winton, and I think it was after Winton had moved out of the house. Okay. And Winton uh, was on the show, and Steve had said to Winton at the end of this segment, I love you more than I love myself. And I said to myself, how can that be? If you love him more than you love yourself, why, are, why have you sabotaged our relationship? You know, what's the problem? What is the problem here? How can you possibly love your son, yet you persecute his mother? So those are things that people don't see or maybe people don't talk about. But that's the, my reality, you know. He's got the show and he's got the access to the public to where he can let them see what he wants them to see. And Basically even like in a the front. Case, even in the case of Marjorie, it's like, oh, we love Winton. We're going to embrace Winton, 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 Winton. And they take all these little stage photos and they have all these little stage shows, you know, but behind the scene, that's child abuse. And it comes in all kinds of forms. You can be mentally and emotionally abusive. It's not always about putting your hands on a child that qualifies for child abuse. So imagine him having to have to live in that atmosphere of the pretense when he knows on the real side what's actually going on. And that's something that we live through. That's something we live through every day. And people don't get to see that. So, you know, a lot of times... Uh, people will make comments, you know, well, Mary needs to get over it and Mary needs to move on as if I've done the deed, you know, and it's not me. Right. I'm not the one being vicious. For the two of them to continue to isolate me from Winton and from his life and to have interfered all these years, who's bitter here? Who's really bitter? Yeah, I was about to ask you that. Are you bitter? Who's bitter? You know, I'm not I'm not trying to uh, interfere mm -hmm. with Marjorie's relationship with her children. I'm not trying to in any way. And there are people on the Internet with gazillion videos out there talking about her and her past or whatever. That's not me saying those things. Those are other people. But how do you, to me, in my everyday, I am moving on in the sense that I'm trying to live with what was done. And this was not about two people got a divorce. People do divorce every day. And there are extended family situations that exist every day, which I applaud people that can do that, especially if the children are involved. There's no point in all this other. But what bothers me is that this was not just a divorce. This was people sitting down in a room conspiring to forge documents to literally leave me by the side of the road dead in every sense of the word. Let's take the child. Let's take the fortune. Let's take the home. Let's bury her. And that part of it I didn't get. You know, when I filed for divorce, I was trying to get out of a bad situation. So you filed for divorce. You left him. Yes. Okay. Yes, I did. I divorced Steve. Steve did not divorce me. I divorced Steve. And it was the fourth time that I had actually filed because I was truly trying to save my family and save my marriage because I was from a broken home in every sense of the word. 
But like I said, people do get divorced. They do. I was just trying to take my children, take my share, and go over there to say, can't do it anymore. I can't do it. Whomever you're seeing, however many you're seeing, go do that. I got to go over here. And I do not know how that morphed into judges being conspired with, judges, my own lawyers being paid off, police departments, uh, city officials. I'm like, what? what is going on? So that is like one nightmare that will not go away, you know? When you're at your home with your child and here comes the police, how, how do you move forward from that nightmare that you're standing in the front yard of your house and here comes the police saying that we are coming to get him because we're sorry, ma'am. And these were their words exactly. We're sorry, ma'am. This has nothing to do with us, but we're doing what we were told to do. How do you move away from that? How do you stop having that nightmare? So they didn't give you an explanation? They, no paperwork, no nothing, you know? Okay, Mary, so after all that you've been through, all that you've overcome, all that you're still fighting with and dealing with, what do you want right now? It's 2017. What do you want right now? In 2017, I want justice. Okay. That's something I've never had. My voice back. I don't want to be perceived as someone that's cruel and evil and vindictive and bitter because that's not who I am. I want to, I want people to know the entire story, not just bits and pieces that were bought and paid for. A little window, I'm going to show them this little window because that's what's been paid for. I want what I worked 16 years to have, mm -hmm. you know, that's my retirement, you know, that's benefits from our company that I deserved, I earned, I worked for. I didn't jump on the back of Steve's life when the cart started rolling. I was there help pushing that cart. And sometimes when the wheels came off that cart, I put the wheels back on the cart. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. I earned everything that was taken from me and everything that was taken from me by Steve and Marjorie forging my name and signing off on things even before she even had the legal right to be called Harvey. I want everything back that the two of them conspired. Ricky Anderson, Bobby Edmonds, everybody involved in this. I want to be able to have my day that I never got. They all sat and conspired to ruin me to ruin my reputation, to ruin me financially, and pretty much leave me by the side of the road. Mm. If, if, if it, was a, it was such a thing as someone being left to die legally, I would have been dead. If it were up to them, I, that would have been the end of me. And I went to jail for not doing anything. So how is it that people can break the law and do what they want to do and manipulate the law and nothing happens because they're of an elite, quote unquote, class. How is that? Uh, so I want back what I worked for. I deserve what I worked for. And I want my share. He can do what he wants with his share. She can do what she wants with what she believes to be her share after she got with him. But bottom line, Everything that's been happening since 2005 belongs to me. Half, half of everything that they both own and do right now because he stole mine to rebuild the two of them. And that is against the law. And I want them both held accountable for it. I want them held accountable for it. Mm -hmm. And I would prefer... But you know what? I wouldn't even wish upon them what they did to me. Wow. It can be settled. It can, we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. But I want back what was taken from me.
that's what I want. I like <clears throat> I like what you said. You want what you earn. I want what I earn. Not not a handout from no, him. You no. want what This is you not about I want Steve's during money. The 16 I want years. my money. I want mine back. I want what I earned and I worked for. He got to take his and he got to take mine and that is against the law that is not is what's supposed to be happening here it's not what's supposed to be happening and i'm not going to stop talking about it until i get returned to me what belongs to me because i have i i worked and i earned the right to live how i set in motion for myself to live because when we both met, we both had nothing. And we both sat down and said, you know, we want to live pretty cool. We never saw that, though. We never saw it to that extent. Mm -hmm. But what makes it even worse is that they did that and just kind of steamrolled over me without, after all these years, not a, you know, we shouldn't have done it. Oh, that was mean. It's like they just go on in their day to day, like nothing has ever happened. Like what they did to me was nothing. You're nothing, or like you had that coming. Who gives them the right to decide that they're going to derail me? Who gives them that right? No one has that right. And I know God didn't tell them that it was okay. It's okay for you to do this to Mary. You didn't get that from God. So if you didn't get it from God, who gave you the right? Either either of them. And that and until that is dealt with, that's gonna ever be out there like something that's in my head and in my sleep and in my dreams when I'm walking around all day long. How do you shake it off? When people deliberately do something like that. I, I can't fathom that because I couldn't do it. I could not continue to get up and go to bed and go to work and you're just out shopping and vacationing when you've ruined somebody. Who does that? And to call yourself a Christian, who does that? I, I don't know. I couldn't, I literally could not sleep at night. There's no way. And you're sitting there looking at my son's face and you watch him come and going on dates and going to school and whatever, knowing what you did to his mother, the two of them. But you love him and you're Christians. I don't see how. I don't see how that's possible. Do you think it's ever gonna be a point that you and Winton are gonna be able to sit down again and you really discuss everything with him? Or do you have an indication that he may know what's really going on? He just, he just won't say nothing because of his father. The hardest part about all of this has been Wenton. Part of me not wanting to say anything, to not bring any more drama to him, but trying to walk that line and say, what do you say? How much do you say? Who do you say it to? Do you say nothing? That seemed like a touchy, every time we mention yeah. Winton, that, that's, that's really a touchy. Because that's the tragedy in all of it. This was so not necessary for yeah. him to be in this like this. All they had to do was be fair. We could have just all gone our separate ways. That's what I don't understand. Why do this to me? Why do this to him when it was so unnecessary? All this could have gotten worked out in 05 and no harm done. Cause that was all I wanted but I can't I can't stay silent I won't stay silent anymore I won't because it, it's like giving them a pass on what they did to me you know I have to live in the trauma of what they did while they're out living their life in a large large way but I have to deal with the deed I, I, I won't I won't not talk about that. I won't do it ever again. I won't. Because I can't survive like that. 
it's like being buried alive. I felt like I had been buried alive and I won't feel like that again. I can't and I just pray that me and my son's relationship survives all of this. I really do. That's my prayer because I'm pretty sure that there are things that were not being made clear to my son either. I'm almost sure things were said that were totally not true. And it would have been easier for all of us to sit down and have this conversation, but they don't want to do that. So here we are. So they're afraid that the actual truth will come out. Absolutely. And he feel like went to your, they probably term went in against him if went to know the whole mm -hmm. truth. Right, right. Okay. But you know what? If that ever happens, that's not me turning him. That's Steve's deeds. Whatever gets revealed, that's something that he did. And it's not about what I revealed. It's about what you did. And it's sad because I would have just said, you know what? It's all right. We all make mistakes. But I was never given that chance to say, it's okay. You cannot go and crap on someone else's life and then you just keep going. At least give them a chance to forgive you. At least give them that chance. But I was never given that chance. It's like, yeah, we're going to do you. You can't do nothing about it. You know, who cares? No. Not anymore. Not anymore. And it was actually days when I would pray that the two of them would wake up and say, you know what, let's call her. Let's call her, let's have this conversation. But it never happened. And I'm done being nice about it. And they, have, done. A, they have your current contact information. So if Absolutely. they were to want to reach you, they could. They have that's, a way to reach out to you. That's up to them even now. It's up to them even now. But like I said, I'm willing to sit down Mm -hmm. Because my truth is my truth. I don't care who knows it or who hears it. So who really has something to hide here? I'm here. I'm approachable. Mm -hmm. Anytime. I always have been. But like I said, for so many years, I was really trying to try to gauge how this is going to affect me and my relationship with my son. And for years and years and years, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. But it's at that point. I can't not. I can no longer do that. All right. I can't do it. Because in that, it gives everybody the pass. It gives Bobby Edmonds a pass. It gives Ricky Anderson a pass. It gives Ricky Smiley a pass for lying. It gives Jocelyn Passarelli a pass for lying. It gives the judges a pass for being starstruck and not wow. listening to the whole story. It gives the, the McKinney courthouse a pass. It gives the police a pass. I can't give everybody a pass. I won't do it. Because my life is just as important as their lives with their children and their husbands and their wives and their functions and their careers and their pensions or whatever else they've gone on to enjoy. Right. And I'm not gonna give them a pass anymore. Now, if someone wants to come and talk to me, they can come and talk to me, but I won't be disrespected anymore. I won't. Proton Max is the new black-owned herbal toothpaste company that believes in old-fashioned values. Commercial toothpastes are loaded with many different toxins and chemicals. That's why Proton Max believes in the natural approach with 16 total ingredients like aloe leaf juice, sea salt, bentonite clay, and peppermint oil. Their ingredients are used to boost your oral health care and enhance your smile. They're good for vegans, vegetarians, smokers, coffee drinkers, adults, and children. Go over to protonmax.com today and show off that smile. 
Unlike Marcia and Mary, I've decided to not even go that far into Marjorie's life because I actually feel like I need to do a whole special video for her because I haven't done enough research on Marjorie over the uh, past few years to dig deep down into her family life and her personal life, boo. So with that being said, here we go. Marjorie Elaine Bridges, being her maiden name, was born on October 10th, 1964. Born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee, to her mother and father. Know they names? Yep, don't feel like talking about it. And yes, she got a brother. Do I know his name? Yep, don't feel like talking about that either right now. Now, how did Marjorie meet Steve? Well... Marjorie's love story with Steve is what fairy tales are made of. They are proof that love at first sight exists even though it takes years to find your way together. The duo originally met in 1987. Steve was doing a stand-up comedy show in Memphis, Tennessee. As revealed by the couple, it was love at first sight for Steve Harvey. Steve claims that he saw her walk right into the Memphis Comedy Club where he was playing and was awed by her personality. The moment he saw Marjorie, he wanted his feelings to be known right then and there without thinking twice. Standing on the stage, he announced, I don't know who you are but I'm going to marry you. However, at the moment, Marjorie had no idea that the statement was dedicated to her. She realized that the announcement was for her when they began dating. Likewise, Steve was still married to his second wife while he developed feelings for Marjorie. Nevertheless, the duo began dating after just a few meetings. However, the relationship wasn't a happy ride for the couple as Steve Harvey disappeared after dating for a few weeks in 1990. Recalling the moment in 2014, Marjorie revealed I knew he was the one shortly after I started dating him, but then he just left, just disappeared. Perhaps Steve wasn't ready to start his new life with the fashionista as he was neither financially secured nor his career was at the peak. Oh, oh okay, those were the reasons. Fortunately, fate brought them together again in 2005. What a coincidence, exactly in 2005 when he had got his uh, divorce from Mary. Mm -hmm. And the duo got reunited. Steve had already ended his second marriage with Mary Lee Shackelford. Also, when Steve got to know about Marjorie being a divorcee, he took a flight to Memphis the next day. And they have been together ever since. Aw, oh, Tito. After dating for two years, Marjorie got hitched to Steve in 2007. Forever. Since then, the duo has been supporting each other through every thick and thin. Oh, so beautiful. After dating for years, Marjorie and Steve got married on June 25th, 2007. Their wedding was a private affair where attendees were only their close friends and family. Since their wedding, they are together like a rock without falling apart. You know, won't he do it? Steve feels like he has got a new life after struggling to find a perfect partner. The fact that they dated for many years dealing with a long distance relationship has really made their relationship stronger. Regarding the same in an interview with Essence, Marjorie said to them, we were friends. We dated years ago, and I think it was the long distance more than anything with Steve and I that made us go our separate ways. Nothing happened. He didn't break my heart. I didn't break his heart. It just was a long distance relationship, and someone would have had to make a decision back then. No one made a move, but it didn't mean we didn't care. It's just sometimes life gets in the way. Marjorie has three kids. Her oldest daughter, Morgan, is 34. Her son, Jason, is 30. They both have the same father, which is Jim L. Townsend. He is the drug dealer man. Y'all know who I'm talking about. He just got out of jail just recently. Stopped playing games. And then she has Lori Harvey, who was supposed to be by Donnie Woods, if I'm not mistaken. That's his name. He's a drug dealer, too. Stop playing games. Don't worry, people. I will not just be skipping over Marjorie. There are definitely some things I want to say about Miss Marjorie Harvey, but I'll be discussing those things just a little bit later but in the meantime don't you remember the video that i just made the other day the one talking about steve harvey and his genealogy his ancestry and don't you remember in that video i said did you know that steve harvey tried to do everything that he could to stop his boo thing of nine years miss terry smith from coming out with her book speaking of their relationship entitled men will lie when the truth will do the king his queen and the other woman well that's what i want to discuss right now people so Check this out. This is a court date dated for December 19th, 
2007 in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Georgia, Atlanta Division, Terry Smith and First Press Direct, Inc., Plaintiff, versus Steve Harvey and Big City Enterprises, Inc., Defendant, and I will try to read as much of this as possible, Complaint for Declaratory and Injunctive Relief, Comes now Terry Smith and First Press Direct, Inc. plaintiffs by and through their attorney complaining of the defendants and respectfully alleging as follows. Plaintiff Terry Smith is a resident of the state of Georgia. Miss Smith is a writer and has published several books through her publishing company, First Press Direct, Inc. First Press Direct, Inc. is a Georgia corporation and has published several books written by Terry Smith. One of the books published by Miss Smith is entitled, Men Will Lie When the Truth Will Do, subtitled, The King, His Queen, and His Other Woman. This book is based on Miss Smith's life during the time of her personal relationship with comedian Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey is a comedian, actor, and radio personality who had a personal and intimate relationship with Miss Smith between 1991 and 2000. Upon information and belief, Mr. Harvey is a resident of the state of Illinois and can be served through his attorney, Mr. Ricky Anderson, located at the Houston, Texas address. Big City Enterprises, Inc. is a Texas corporation. Its principal place of business is in Houston, Texas. Big City Enterprises may be served through its registered agent of service, Wonder Love, Inc. I don't know if you remember that name during um, Marcia's court hearing. Big City Enterprises, Inc. is subject to the jurisdiction of this court and venue properly lies within this judicial district by virtue of its doing substantial business and committing acts of blah, 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 entering and blah. Now we're getting into the statement of the case. Here we go, people. On 1991, Miss Smith met Mr. Harvey in a comedy club. Sounds familiar? Okay. Immediately thereafter, Mr. Harvey and Miss Smith began having a personal relationship. Mr. Harvey flew Miss Smith to cities where he was performing his comedy acts. Travel was often arranged through Mr. Harvey's assistant, Miss Megan, at Mr. Harvey's instructions. The relationship between Miss Smith and Mr. Harvey lasted for nine years. In 2004, Miss Smith wrote the book entitled Men Will Lie When the Truth Will Do, in part based on her life and her personal relationship with Mr. Harvey. The book was, covered, was published by FPD and sold on Miss Smith's website, www.terrysmithonline.com, and at national retail bookstores, wholesale bookstores, and private sales. The book received national attention. Miss Smith had no contact with Mr. Harvey between July 2000 and September 2004. Upon information and belief, it is believed that Mr. Harvey found out about the book. In October 2004, three weeks prior to the release of the book entitled Men Will Lie When the Truth Will Do, Miss Smith received a phone call from a family friend in Richmond, Virginia, informing her that Mr. Harvey has people looking for Miss Smith. Contacts the gentleman in Richmond, Virginia, who told her Mr. Harvey wanted to speak with her and give her Mr. Harvey's number. Reluctantly, Miss Smith called Mr. Harvey, who said he wanted to apologize for the way he treated her and asked her for the opportunity to see her. In November 2004, Miss Smith met Mr. Harvey at Ritz Carlton Hotel in Atlanta, Georgia, during the film promotion of Mr. Harvey's movie, Racing Stripes. Shortly therefore, Mr. Harvey's attorney, Ricky Anderson, contacted Miss Smith to try and purchase the rights of the book, which was a direct assault on Mr. Harvey's client, clean cut, good guy, and likable Christian image. Upon information and belief, Big City Enterprises, Inc. is the alter ego of Mr. Harvey. And this was established by Mr. Harvey's attorney, 
Ricky Anderson to protect Mr. Harvey's image and serve as buffer between Mr. Harvey and various third parties. Oh, okay. In March of 2005, Mr. Harvey contacted Miss Smith by telephone to inform her that the radio and air personality Wendy Williams in New York mentioned Miss Smith's book, Men Will Lie When the Truth Will Do, on air. Miss Smith also announced that she was interested in having Miss Smith come to New York to make a guest appearance to discuss the book, Men Will Lie When the Truth Will Do, on Miss Williams show. April 2005, New York Post reporter of Page Six contacted Miss Smith manager, Miss McGown, inquiring interest in doing a story on Smith's book, Men Will Lie When the Truth Will Do, and Miss Smith's relationship with Mr. Harvey. Upon information about a certain reporter that contacted Mr. Harvey's attorney, Mr. Ricky Anderson, with questions about the book, Men Will Lie When the Truth Will Do, and his client, Mr. Harvey's relationship with Miss Smith. Attorney Ricky Anderson denied knowing or having knowledge of Miss Smith and any relationship Miss Smith had with Mr. Harvey or the book, Men Will Lie When the Truth Will Do. Attorney Ricky Anderson did in fact meet Miss Smith and Miss McGowan in 1997 in a hotel suite along Mr. Harvey after the taping of Mr. Harvey's Live Down South Somewhere HBO special. Attorney Ricky Anderson threatened Page Six with the lawsuit if they published the story. Hmm. During the discussions about the purchase of the book, Mr. Ricky Anderson repeated, Mr. Harvey demands that the books be removed from every retail, wholesale, bookstores, and private site at www.terrysmithonline.com. In the agreement, acknowledged by writer of work for higher status drafted by Mr. Ricky Anderson. The parties agreed per their telephone discussions that Miss Smith would maintain the right to modify the material for a theatrical release and modified book release. The defendants also require Miss Smith to execute a buy and sell agreement selling the rights to the book Men will lie when the truth will do in exchange for $120,000 in which the defendant has paid. On August 9th, 2007, Miss Smith submitted to defendants a synopsis of the rights to her life for their review. Defendants failed and refused to respond to Miss Smith's synopsis. Miss Smith is desirous of pursuing the theatrical production of the story about her life with Mr. Harvey. Miss Smith is in the process of modifying the story for the theatrical release. Defendants have indicated that they will try and prevent such a release based on the language of the agreement. The acknowledgement by writer of work for higher status is vague and ambiguous in that it takes away certain rights that is pur purposely given to Miss Smith. At the time that the parties discussed these agreements, Miss Smith did not have an attorney review the documents submitted by the defendants. Hmm. Defendants through their attorney have on numerous occasions conspired to defraud individuals like Miss Smith, of their property rights in bad faith and in order to protect the personal interests of who? Mr. Harvey, by virtue of the facts, see and forth herein, in an actual controversy exists between plaintiffs and defendants herein. Now Terry uh, Smith lawyers are giving their reasons, count one, count two, on why this whole work for hire agreement is bogus. Count one, the agreements are void and unenforceable. Defendants, acknowledgement by writer of work for hire status to be a work for hire agreement whereby plaintiff's book entitled Men Will Lie When the Truth Will Do was prepared within the scope of her employment. Plaintiff's book was not a work made for hire as that the term is defined in, then they gave, give a, you know, in 17 USC 101, and therefore plaintiffs retain the copyright to the book. 
the acknowledgement by right of, of work for higher status to also take away certain of the plaintiff's intellectual property rights while at the same time allowing her to retain the right to modify the material for a theatrical release. This should be construed against the defendants who drafted the agreement. The buy and sell agreement also claims to convey the plaintiff's copyrights to the book, Men Will Lie When the Truth Will Do, to defendants. The agreements are void and or unenforceable in that they both violate the provisions of the United States Copyright Act. Count to fraud. The defendants knew that the plaintiffs were not represented by an attorney and quickly faxed their agreements from the plaintiff. Defendants represented to the plaintiffs that they would be able to retain the rights to modify the book for a theatrical release when they made this representation. They knew that the plaintiffs would rely on the representation in entering into the agreement. Defendants representation was false in that they included language in the agreement that helps to keep the plaintiffs from releasing any modified version of the book. Defendants actions constitutes fraud. At the end of this court document, it basically says in a nutshell, plaintiffs pray that the court declare that buy and sell agreement is generally null and or void and or unenforceable because it operates for all practical purposes to deprive the plaintiffs of their federally protected rights by the United States Copyright Act and um, award the plaintiffs their reasonable attorney fees and costs associated with this action and afford such other relief as the court may deem reasonable and proper. This is basically what Ms. Terry Smith and her attorney were asking for. This court document is dated for December 14th, 2007. Now, whatever happened with this court case, I don't know. Can't find nothing else. But look, I figure that everything must have stopped as far as Terry Smith and her book because first of all, men will lie when the truth will do. The king, the queen, and the other woman. Can't find that. And then Terry was supposed to come out with a second novel in 2005 called Your Honor. And I can just imagine what that would have been about. You know what I mean? And can't find that and then she was supposed to be doing some type of play or something that was called um dick d-i-c discipline of intimacy and communication where is that at i don't know and then her publication her publishing company first direct press inc that's closed down that publishing company in a, in, in georgia closed so some happened where steve made terry wait a minute let me say that correct Steve and his attorney, Ricky Anderson, made Terry Smith disappear. Well, if Steve and Ricky was trying to make uh, Terry disappear, she can't go too far messing with Geneva because I done found her. So this name that she uses, Terry Smith, that she used for her book and uh, her publishing company and everything else, come to find out her real name is Teresa Elizabeth Smith, being her maiden name, born on May 4th, 1962. She is currently 59 years old, and she was actually married before. She married a guy by the name of Ruth. Dell Richardson and they were married on or in September of 1987 until August of 1990 and remember what I said in the court documents she actually met Steve Harvey at the comedy club in 1 1991 so just one year later after her divorce she meets and start dating Steve Harvey. After dealing with Steve, you know, whatever, back in 2007 when she did her court date, she married a guy by the name of Miles Dixon in 2012. During my research about Terry Smith, I came across this website and it says, in 2000, Dixon, Miles Dixon, had a daughter from a failed marriage. However, according to Miles, it was at the very moment of the birth that he knew he was meant to be the rest, who he was meant to be for the rest of his life, her dad. He knew not because of the great teaching from his father, but because God had said, Miles, I will teach you how to be the dad she will need. The year 2000 is forever special to Miles because he was blessed to be a 24 seven determined to be present. Best thing in the world to be daddy. Dixon remarried in 2012 to 
Terry Dixon, and he gives all the credit to his wife for blessing the lives of he and his daughter. She gives my daughter and me so much happiness and joy that I can scarcely contain it all, says Dixon. Terry changed my life for the best. Dixon began this tradition in 2000 after becoming a dad and now is very proud to share that his fraternity formed in 2009 with other brown dads who are proud and deserving of the title dad. While his background is in business, Miles Dixon found himself more and more wanting to birth his purpose to inspire a lasting bond between parent and child. In 2016, Dixon and his wife started the Determined to be Present Inc. D2BP Foundation, nonprofit foundation. The D2BP Foundation seeks out other higher performing nonprofits and charities whose programs and services set a high standard of quality in creating meaningful social change that also mirrors in the mission of D2BP. When I found this Brown Dad nonprofit organization by Terry Dixon and her husband, Miles Dixon, I said, ooh, I wonder, does this have anything to do with that abortion that she had? Because you know they said, or let me just say it like this, I had heard that Terry had got pregnant by Steve and she had an abortion. So I didn't know if this, you know, nonprofit organization has something to do with her feeling some sort of type of way because she had an abortion. So she's trying to help kids and with their fathers or whatever because Steve wasn't there. I don't know, but people, I'm just trying to tell you that this is some crazy stuff. Now, look, I don't know if you have heard of this, but there is this letter or something going around that has been going around on social media for a while now. And people have been trying to figure out who has this letter came from. Was this letter written by Mary, Marjorie, Marcia, Terry? Some other woman, people just want to know who wrote this letter. Steve, what, what, what's going on? Well, let me read the letter to you. And it says, if you ask me, what do I think he would say about the book? My answer is this. I heard him say once that the biggest thing that President Clinton did wrong was to tell the truth. He said he doesn't care if you have a picture of him with some woman with his ass up in the air and his social security number tattooed across it. He would still say it ain't me. I wasn't there. A man will lie when the truth will do. Steve, today I sit here wondering why I sacrificed myself. I look at the condom package that you left here on my nightstand and wonder how confident you feel when it comes down to predicting my actions. You are so confident about this relationship that you stop at a store and bought a condom before coming over to see me to talk. And when I read over the copies of the sexual email exchanges that we shared, you asking me to spread my legs open so you can slide your cock in deep in my pussy or you asking me to tell you to stick your cock in my ass, I saved them. I read over them from time to time when I am thinking of you. Today they caused me pain and sadness trying to read between the lines. You ended the exchanges with good night, my lover. For eight years, we have been lovers. And you have been taking me through unnecessary emotional lows, abortions, you getting married and falsely convincing me that you are getting a divorce, falsely convincing me that you are arranging a way for me to get a new car for my birthday, calling my mother and telling her that you were in love with her daughter and that you would pay my rent if I would leave the other person in my life and stay in Los Angeles. Your promises have hurt me for the last time. The night that you brought this condom over, your words were, I will work out something to get you the money and handle the cost of relocating my furniture and car, and then you fucked me twice. You came to me and asked me to change my life for you. You said you would pay the rent and other expenses until I could get on my feet. So I took your word as law and stayed, but you have not kept your word. Looking back over the past years, more of the recent years, I get the feeling that you are intentionally trying to cause me torment and anguish. This is a life you have done this to. I have tried numerous times to reach you so I can get the wise answered. Like when I came to you and told you I was pregnant and you said that I did not force you to. I need for you to tell me, how can you mistreat someone that has been with you through all of your ups and downs? 
Why do you keep continue to cause the pains to the ones that you say that you love? Why did you do what you did the last night that we were together, the night that Megan's mother passed away? You have caused my life to be messed up and we need to resolve this. I am tired. I can and will not allow you to destroy my mind and my life this way. This what I just read is a page from Terry's book. Men will lie when the truth will do the king, his queen and his other woman. And it sounds like Terry was pizzazazist at Steve Harvey. He did something to her. But don't you remember in the court documents that part in there that was in 2004 where it said that Steve had got word or he had heard that Wendy Williams said that she wanted Terry to be on her show and talk about the book. And then remember that Steve had somebody from I think Richmond, Virginia or something like that contact Terry. And then Terry contacted or whatever Steve. And then when she came and met him at the Ritz Carlton in Atlanta, he apologized to her for the way he had treated treated her that definitely caught my attention because remember they hadn't seen each other since a 2000 when they broke up till 2004 when she came out with her book so for the first thing for him to be saying is him apologizing something had transpired to make her upset and then you read this letter and she talking about a car and some money or some other stuff and some things he did and her finding out that he would that uh he had got married and talking about he was going to get a divorce definitely upset and let's not play we know we heard terry mention that abortion so she could have been too happy about that but anyway don't you remember earlier in this video i had mentioned that mary said that when she was with steve they were broke and they were eating jiffy mix cornbread well if they were eating jiffy mix cornbread at least they had the money for the sugary cornbread because Steve and Marcia must have been eating the homemade cornbread without the sugar because she was with Steve at the end of the 70s going into the 80s. I mean, they married February 14th, 1981. So I know that Mary feels like she was with Steve during his struggle time. But yeah, he could have been struggling as a comedian, but it really didn't take him too long after they got married before he was on Me and the Boys and based on Marcia's court records he was making a million dollars a year let's go through steve harvey's timeline right quick so we got steve harvey met marcia like about 78 79 and they married in 81 then about one and a half years later in 82 they had the twin daughters and then steve met mary about what 87 89 something like that said at a comedy club and they uh kind of fell in love well mind you he was still married to marcia at that point but then in 1990 when marcia was pregnant with broderick jr her and steve separated and then in 1990 he also said that he met marjorie at the strip club and i mean at the strip club at the comedy club <laughs> and told her that i'm gonna make you my wife now this is all in 1990 okay and then in 91 the next year broderick jr is born but then that same year in 91 terry smith says she met steve at a comedy club and then they instantly started dating for nine years in 91 but then two years later marcia files for divorce in 93 so he is dating terry in 93 and then in 94 marcia and steve divorced two years later him and mary mary but remember five years before that because they said that Mary said five years before they got married, they were already shacking up. This is in 91, people. So in 91, Broderick Jr. is born. In 91, he meets Terry. And in 91, him and Mary moves in together. This man didn't waste no time. And as a matter of fact, I almost forgot in 91, he was still married to Marcia because she didn't even file for divorce until 93. And you know how relationships are, especially with your spouse, a baby mama, baby daddy. He was probably still having sex while he was having sex with Terry, while he was having sex with Mary. And ain't no telling who else. Because I really think, and he was also still messing with, or messing with Marjorie too. But anyway, like I was saying, him and Mary, married in 96. Then the next year in 97, Winston is born. Then in 97, if you can also remember Terry Smith court documents, she said that in 97, she met Ricky Anderson and Steve Harvey with her attorney in a hotel room when Steve was taping Down South Somewhere HBO special. And then in 2000, we have Terry and Steve broke up and then they didn't have any other dealings with each other 
from 2000 to 2004. Then in 2004, he reached back out to her. And I'm assuming that this time he was still having issues with Mary because then in 2005, him and Mary gets a divorce. And then at this time, he is going through court proceedings still with Terry Smith. And I mean, look, this man just, uh, yeah. Anyways, before I forget, let me throw out some things that I may have forgot to mention, but I remember, so I'm going to throw it out right now. Don't you remember that um, I said that Steve Harvey did not graduate from college and he went to West Virginia University? Now, Steve is a Phi Beta Kappa Psi Phi Kappa, no disrespect to anybody fraternities, but I don't know the name of it, but he's supposed to be something because of West Virginia University. And people find that kind of weird considering the fact that he didn't graduate, so I didn't even know that you can be in a fraternity if you didn't graduate from from college but then based on my research if you if you remember that genealogy thing I was talking about remember I had said that his um, ancestor family member Burr Prillerman was like the president of the first color school over there at West Virginia University so I wonder if that have anything to do with it and don't you remember I had said uh, when I was reading to you about the child abuse reports and it said in there that Winston said that he his father hit him Steve Harvey hit him with a belt and with a paddle board and Mary said that the paddleboard was like something that they used from the fraternities. Mm -mm. I wonder if that have anything because I had heard that that fraternity paddleboard from West Virginia University is the one that he had used on Winton. I don't know. I'm just telling you what I heard. And I also heard, don't you remember I had said in 2008 when Winton came home and Mary seen them bruises on him, made that child abuse report. And then I had read an article that said that Winston missed his father and Mary sent him back with his father. Well, based on what I heard, that is not true. That Winston did not want to go back with his father and Mary did not want to release her son back to Steve. That was the whole point of the um, child abuse report was to make sure that her son didn't go back. But that's when Steve sent his bully security guard and the police over there to snatch Winston away. And I heard from that incident, Winton never went back home, which ultimately sent Mary in a tailspin because, look, you ain't finna take all this woman money, sit up here try to snatch her house and stuff from her, you know, throw this woman in her face, then come over there where she found out that you done abused her son, then send your bully bodyguards, police, and whoever else she sent over there to come and snatch Winton, then come to the media and then say some, you know, Winton wanted to come home because he missed me, Mary sent him back, Mary sent him to the airport. I heard Mary didn't even have no damn money, so how she gonna put Winton on the plane when she didn't even have no money, just like how you gonna sue her, this Oprah thing, when she ain't even got no money? You know, just a whole bunch of nonsense. And then, can somebody please explain to me, parents, mothers, can you please explain what is right about how Marjorie handled this situation? You gonna sit up there and just be having her son kissing all on you and he calling your mommy a happy Mother's Day and you just putting this on social media so Mary can see it. You and Steve just smushing this all in Mary's face that you ain't getting your son back. I done took everything from you. I got me a new wife. I'm living this good life. Just all in the woman face. I mean, every time I see these pictures with Winton kissing and stuff all over Marjorie, I'm telling you, because I used to sit up there and go on Marjorie's uh, 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 Winton's social media pages to see was he saying happy mother's day and happy birthday to his mom nope only seeing that for marjorie can you just imagine the things that they were saying to winton when mary was in jail like what type of information were they feeding him like just everything that was happening throughout the divorce throughout the even after the so-called divorce what were they saying to Winton about his mama? Just feeding him all type of bad things. Uh-huh, Margie, I'm coming for you, girl. I got a special video just for you. And then can somebody please explain to me how Mary went to jail for talking and Steve didn't go to jail for whooping his son to the point that his son was having pain when he urinated? Very confused by that, very extremely let me just make this plain and clear i'm not saying that mary was an angel no one is perfect but 
There's certain things that she just didn't deserve. That's all I'm saying. But is she perfect? No. She did some things wrong too. Because don't you remember in the video where she was talking and she was talking about that she can't believe how Marjorie was the way that she was and if you was a real woman and the mother and how you would have handled things with my son? Well, that's how I kind of feel about her and the whole Marcia situation. Did you make sure that Steve was giving Marcia her money for child support? While your husband was making a million dollars a year, you know, with me and the boys and um, at that time, Showtime at the Apollo and whatever else he was doing at that time. Did you make sure that Marcia's um, child support was paid? Uh, nope, you didn't. Well, people, I think I'm about to go. A sister's tad. It's been a lot of work exposing Steve Harvey. And to be perfectly honest with you, I'm still not done with Steve. But um, what I do want to say is, uh, don't you know that book that Miss Terry Smith came out with in 2004 entitled Men Will Lie When the Truth Will Do, The King, His Queen, and the Other Woman? You know what book I'm talking about. I'm talking about the book that Miss Terry Smith took Steve to court for in 2007 because this man tried to do everything that he can do, him and his attorney, Ricky Anderson, to stop Miss Terry Smith from coming out with this book, exposing their relationship, once again entitled... Men will lie when the truth will do, the king, his queen, and the other woman? Yeah, well, uh, I think we should read that book. What you think? Stay tuned. If you would like to advertise your business in Geneva's Closet, you can email me at genevascloset22 at gmail.com. I would like to know how you all feel about this situation and why you are letting me know. Could you please like and share this video and subscribe to Geneva's Closet if you haven't already done so right here on YouTube. And you can follow me on Facebook at what? At Geneva's Closet. And you can email me at genevascloset22 at gmail.com. You all have a fabulous day and I will talk to you later. Bye.